Good morning, Rock of Ages. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see you again. I'm grateful for having had uh, the opportunity last weekend to attend a family event uh, back up in the Midwest. And my thanks as always to Pastor Dick Heinland for so ably filling in for me. How'd you do on the quiz? I, I was going to give out, get out of church free cards to those who... Connie gets out of church free today, <laughs> if mom will let her. <laughs> well, this is the 19th Sunday after the season of Pentecost, and uh, I, I quizzed a few people earlier about how many seasons in the season, or how many Sundays in the season of Pentecost are there? A lot, somebody said. <laughs> 26. Uh, the reason I, I highlight this each time is I want us all to stay focused on the fact that even though the world is zigging and zagging around us all the time, that the church is this steady stream that allows us to ground ourselves in something far greater than our problems, far greater than the world's temporary issues. So I hope you can remember that, that uh, focusing on the church as our anchor, as our grounding, will provide us peace in a time when it's so difficult to find peace. Anyway, a few other things I'd like to share with you this morning. I want to welcome those of you who are visiting with us this morning. Um, I had uh, originally scheduled that beginning next Sunday and the following, that we would do a uh, <clears throat> prospective new members class. Well, a couple of the folks that wanted to be part of it uh, could not be, had been called away for uh, some indeterminate period of time. So I thought I'll just wait uh, until we can include them. So stay tuned for uh, an updated uh, date. Um, the rummage sale that you've heard about uh, continues to be prepared for. And you can bring your donations to it uh, whenever the church office is open um, and place them on the uh, wire uh, racks that are around the fellowship hall. The event itself will occur on Saturday the 23rd and there will be an associated bake sale with it. Now, if you're going to contribute to that bake sale, um, don't bring your stuff this week, <laughs> um, unless it is hard candy. Uh, bring it on Friday the 22nd. Is that right, Doris? You want it on Friday the 22nd? Uh, yes. Okay. Well, even if they brought it the morning of the 22nd, uh, the 23rd, you can bring it. Yeah, okay. The morning of the 23rd will be, be fine as It'll well. Be um, also, uh, I think it got mentioned last week that you know, one of the things that we miss in church that is so central to our experience is choir, is singing. And so we, we'd like to uh, claw our way back into some semblance of, of choir. That requires a couple of things. First of all, it requires willing volunteers uh, to, to say, you know, I think I can do that. I can commit to uh, singing on Sundays. And uh, remember when we had uh, about four or so people up front as song leaders? You know, it wasn't like a full-blown choir, but it was nice to have it here. And, um, you, you know, if, if the second thing we need is if, if there is somebody who uh, says, you know, I, I've had some experience leading choirs, and, and, and I would do that, um, let us know in the office. We, we would love to be able to get a choir function uh, back underway. You know, as I am fond of thinking and sometimes say, we need to scratch and claw our way back to normalcy. Uh, we can't just sit back and let the circumstances of a pandemic dictate to us what we can and can't do to a, a, a certain degree. So uh, we want to try to reinstitute things as best we can, and it requires participation. You've heard me say that over and over in all my years here is that participation is the key. Um, I think that's about it 
for today. Let's, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. Uh, Doris, our parish nurse, is uh, speaking of scratching and clawing our way back in her leopard outfit. Uh, <laughs> Is, is going to reinstitute. <laughs> I'm sorry, I apologize. <laughs> is going to reinstitute our blood pressure screening uh, stuff, which she used to do with some regularity. That will occur uh, immediately after service around the, the bend. There's a, a little room back there, there's a table set up, and it's a very discreet thing. And, and she keeps a record of it so that you are uh, aware of any uh, changes as time goes on. So thank you, Doris, for uh, being ready to reinstitute that. Let's start our day off today by greeting one another in the name of the Lord. Hey guys, very important. You know, one last thing I forgot to announce. Remember, we uh, had instituted a survey on masks, optional, mandatory. Uh, we got all those back. Guess what the count was? 50-50. Which is why it makes council so much fun to make decisions to try to do the will of the congregation. <laughs> we continue to stay vigilant and as changes are warranted, we will bring them to you. Let's begin today. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, the one God who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open and all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's confess our sins among one another and before God. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot be for ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, and have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister in the Church of Jesus Christ, it's my humble privilege to be able to declare to everyone here, no matter what you've done, no matter how bad you think it is, your sins have been forgiven in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's join our voices in an opening hymn this morning, Let the Whole Creation Cry.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. The peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. The peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. And for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. morning is taken from the second chapter of Genesis. The preface. Genesis 2 stresses that people are not meant to live in isolation, but in relationship. Out of love for humanity, God creates them male and female to provide companionship for each other and to become with each other one flesh. The Hebrew words here are ish for male and ishes for woman. The Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all cattle and to the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for the man, there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. Therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, 
and they become one flesh. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from Hebrews, the first and the second chapters. The preface. Quoting from the Psalms, this passage from Hebrews emphasizes that Jesus, the one through whom God created everything and who sits at God's right hand, is also the one who experienced human suffering and death in order to blaze the path of salvation for us. The reading. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. When we had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name that he has inherited in more excellent than theirs. Now, God did not subject the coming world about which we are speaking to angels, but someone has testified somewhere. <coughs> what are human beings that you are mindful of them, or mortals that you care for them? You have made them for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Now, in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them, but we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand, if able, for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel lesson this morning in the 10th chapter of Mark uh, presents a difficult uh, message for us. Um, Jesus came into this world and entered a new reality. And in this new reality, there was uh, a new acceptance decreed by Jesus for both women and children, both of whom who did not have that kind of acceptance in the Jewish culture prior to this. The gospel, as it's recorded in the 10th chapter of Mark. Glory to the Lord. Now some Pharisees came, and to test him they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And he answered them, What did Jesus command you? And they said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female, and for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. See, there are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then, in the house of the disciples, asked him again about this matter, and he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. 
And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And then we've got this, this shift that somehow seems like, how do these two things go together? People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. You know, timing is everything. Um, had I be, been more vigilant about the lectionary cycle, uh, the three-year sequence of readings, and been more aware of the fact that today's text is this one about divorce, I would have planned last week <laughs> differently. <laughs> I would have left it to this pro uh, to deal with. But as I uh, approach the preparation for this message this morning, I recognize that we need to confront the difficult passages in the scripture just as we uh, confront those that make us feel good. But, you know, the good news is always that there is grace in what Jesus has to say to us. Last weekend, we attended a, a wedding back in the Midwest of um, my nephew. It was a beautiful wedding. But uh, the thought crossed my mind, are they gonna be one of the 50% who don't make it? Those are the statistics in our society. 50% of marriages dissolve in divorce. Well, that certainly is not a comforting thought for um, uh, us attending a joyful experience. You know, uh, as I approached this scripture, as I often do, I said to myself, what would Jesus do? Or what would Jesus say? And so it became especially important to think that through in the analysis of, of this text. What would Jesus do or say when he was confronted with this issue of divorce? Well, quite clearly, we have it in today's lesson. In the first century, we need uh, to understand the context maybe a little better so that we know what divorce was in those days. Divorce in those days, keep in mind this was a patriarchal society, governed by the uh, 613 Jewish laws and policed by the Pharisees. And um, women had no rights in those days, nor did children. They were both considered chattel. And as the scripture tells us, uh, a man simply, for whatever reason he chose, could issue a certificate of divorce to the woman, which meant that she was now cast off and without a male to provide for her, she became, in many cases, prostitutes, homeless, destitute. What would Jesus say about that? Well, we, we get to know. These Deuteronomic laws that were part of the Jewish culture for all of those years certainly was harsh. And also we see in the second part of the scripture lesson this morning that uh, children were not allowed to have a voice. They were told to get back and shut up. And, and Jesus basically said, no, 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 let, let them come to me. So, so what's going on here with these two stories? Well, as I said at the beginning, Jesus brought a new reality into the world. And part of that new reality is that women 
were accepted as equal to men in the eyes of Jesus. It says so right in the text. You shall be joined as one person. And children, let them come to me, for no one can enter the kingdom of heaven unless they have the heart and mind of a child. Open, blank, ready to receive the things that were so difficult for people to understand. So the conflict, uh, confliction that the Pharisees had was that there were two schools of thought. Uh, the first school that, uh, that existed was um, a school that was pretty harsh, that basically uh, allowed no latitude uh, in divorce, had these very harsh consequences for people who were divorced, women who were divorced. And then there was a liberal school called the Hillel School uh, that basically granted um, more flexibility to, to the women. So if you're a Pharisee and you're conflicted between these two schools, th this more rigid school and this, this more uh, open school, what do you choose? You see the conflict that they had. So they went to Jesus and they asked him, what do you think about this? And Jesus very clearly told them that they had hard hearts. He basically was convicting them that they did not have the best interest of all people in, in mind. Yet he went on to reiterate that the law as it existed said that those who remarried committed adultery. It was, in fact, part of their culture. And as he talked about the children coming to him with open minds, it presented a new model. Remember, children were not allowed in worship at all. And now Jesus is saying, let them come to me. So, so what do we take from these two stories? I think that the bottom line good news is that when Jesus entered the world bringing a new reality, and that reality was that we were all created in God's image, loved unconditionally, that that applied to women as well as men. And the men were castigated by him accusing them of having hard hearts something that they had inherited in their deuteronomic responsibilities as Pharisees. So Jesus kind of turned the world upside down for all of them. In the, in the second chapter of Genesis, uh, as a reminder, we read, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Um, in that wedding I mentioned of my nephew um, last week, I saw something that they did that I'd never seen at a wedding. They did foot washing. Have you ever seen foot washing at a wedding? Um, it was the most touching act of service and equality that I think I've ever seen, and I thought, that is wonderful. Sharing that act of service that Jesus performed on his disciples during that Passover time was a great lesson for us as we think about the relationship in marriage. That we are to serve one another. We are now one flesh. We're not lesser people because of our gender. And Jesus went on to let everybody know that he loved all humanity unconditionally. So I know that in our world today, my family, your family, divorce has been um, a frequent occurrence. And uh, the good news is that Jesus says it's more important that we live a life of acceptance and have a joy-filled life than it is to stick to these strict Pharisaic laws. So, when we think about divorce in modern times, 
and we think about the uh, harshness of it and the, the negative aspects of it as it's uh, being undertaken, what's the other side of it? The other side of it is joy. The other side is to find a life of satisfaction, a, a life of completion that was intended in the first place. And so it's good for us to remember that when Jesus came into the world, the apple cart got totally turned upside down. And remember what he said at the end of his public ministry? He gave us a commandment. And that commandment was to love God and to love one another. That's the bottom line. And it doesn't say anything about you can only love somebody if you were originally married to him. Uh, he is making it an all-inclusive thing that we are to love one another. I hope that's the good news that you can take from reading the scripture. And as you encounter scripture and difficult things that, that may uh, give you pause, remember the last thing he said, <laughs> love one another. That trumps everything else. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Please stand, if able, as we join our voices today in singing the hymn of the day, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. as we profess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for today's prayers. <clears throat> May children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Holy One, you have raised up faithful leaders throughout history. Empower those discerning a call to ministry and all seminarians that they continue to be formed for the sake of the gospel. Protect Don and Ken Bishop as they spread your word in Kosovo. Lord, in your mercy, through our prayer. You have established a diverse and beautiful creation. Revive declining species and preserve endangered lands. Cultivate in us a sense of wonder for the world you have created. 
Lord, in your mercy. You desire for us not to be alone and to live in community with one another. Strengthen relationships between nations and peoples that we celebrate and support one human family. Lord, in your mercy. You share in our experiences and struggles. Bless all who live with any mental or physical disability. Inspire creative communities, spaces, and environments that they are accessible and hospitable. Bless all those listed on our prayer list, as well as any names we now lift up with the spoken word or in the silence of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, you have established and nourished relationships that extend beyond those gathered here today. Bless members who can no longer travel to worship with us and remind us of their continued role in this community of faith. Lord, in your mercy, you promised eternal life to all your children. Thank you for the people of faith who have gone before us. Strengthen our trust we have in you, Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our heart known only to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, as all of God's people say, Amen. 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 The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. At this time, we, in the past, during the service, we would pass the uh, offering plates. Uh, we've now um, started having them up front, so if you're visiting, uh, you, when you come to communion, uh, you can bring your, uh, your offering if you have one and place it in one of the plates at the end of each aisle. If unable to come to the plates, feel free to hand your offering to an usher. During uh, this time, we want to thank you for your continued uh, support and uh, faithfulness during um, the pandemic and over this past year, which has been so challenging for all of us. Uh, the next slide I believe Karen's going to put up it, um, <clears throat> reflects, and hopefully you noticed for those present, uh, when you came into the, um, the fellowship hall today, the balloons and the signage that indicates that um, the second mortgage reduction campaign has ended. This was a 24-week campaign, and um, it's, as you saw out there and on the slide, we have reached uh, $65,900 and 32 cents. So applaud you all for uh, your contributions and our willingness to help with this. Um, I will say that all the proceeds from the October 23rd rummage sale and bake sale will also be added to that total. So stay tuned. I will update that graph after that event, and we'll have a grand total of what has just now been raised. As chair of the stewardship team, I want to acknowledge and thank all the team members who have been uh, working and helping uh, to make these efforts possible. Uh, John Nyes, um, Stan John, for those who don't know John, he's our <laughs> now president. You probably all know John. Yay! Uh, Catherine Lane, who, who uh, due to her work schedule, is not generally here on Sundays, but she's been very active. Uh, Dennis Jacobson, who many of you know, kind of moved north, but he, I think we'll see him again maybe this uh, winter if he comes back down some. And Randy Chittister, who's back standing already uh, by the AV uh, team. So um, thank you. Um, small team, so I'll put a plug in here. We certainly would appreciate and could uh, offer you um, some uh, opportunity to offer your uh, skills with our, with our team. As a small token of our appreciation for um, the success of the campaign, as you leave today, um, we see Randy and Karen Stahl will be helping out, uh, just uh, handing you a small token of our appreciation. So uh, thank you again. Thank you very, very much. Let us not forget that the stewardship function in this church has been run in a stellar manner under your leadership. Mm -hmm. So we thank you, Karen. Okay.
Let us pray. God of all creation, all you have made is good, and your love endures forever. You bring forth bread from the earth and fruit from the vine. Nourish us with these gifts that we might be for the world signs of your gracious presence in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending in which Jesus was betrayed that he took bread and he blessed it, broke it and gave it to his disciples to eat saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And then again after supper he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it for them to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of sin for all people. Do this and share it for all time in my name. And now we say the prayer that our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. These are the gifts of grace given to you and I as reminders who we are and whose we are. We give thanks to Almighty God that we have this opportunity to be reminded, to be assured that we are loved unconditionally in this meal of grace. In just a few moments, we'll be inviting you forward to one of two stations. Uh, you can be seated. If you're relatively new to this process, uh, wait for the usher to call you down, and uh, as you come forward, you'll encounter the station where you'll be given a wafer, and then the opportunity to select a pre-filled cup, either of grape juice or wine. And just both items, return to your places by the outside aisle. And as Karen suggested, if you would remember to bring your offering and drop it in the trays up front. I uh, want to reiterate that the reason that we've made this shift is that uh, bringing your offerings is an act of worship. And to incorporate it into this moment in the service is entirely appropriate and lifts up the sanctity of what it is we are doing by bringing our gifts. In just a moment, you'll be asked to come forward.
now may this meal of Christ's body and blood strengthen you, assure you, and give you the absolute peace that it is intended. May you be blessed as you go forward into this world knowing who you are and whose you are, disciples of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. God of abundance, with this bread of life and the cup of salvation, you have united us to Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit, that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world, and continue forever with the living of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, as usual, for attending worship this morning. It's good to see all of you here and uh, to welcome some of you back who have been away for quite some time. Uh, we are going to uh, see this place fill up again. I am absolutely confident of it. That's my prayer. I want to thank those of you at home who have uh, chosen to spend some time watching uh, this worship service online. Uh, we hope this has been a blessing for you. And now, let's depart with these ancient words. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen. Let's join our voices as we depart, singing, On Our Way Rejoicing. 